My name is Lee McIntyre. I was born in Portland, Oregon, but I live now in Newton, Massachusetts. I'm a philosopher of science, and I've gotten very interested in the question of science denial as a practical matter. I started writing books to try to change things. What I want to change is how we approach science denial to try to make science more accepted in the culture as a whole, which you wouldn't think would be that tough of a sell. But these days, it turns out to be. It'll start getting cooler. I you wish just, you just watch. I wish science agreed with you. <laughs> hey, well, I don't think science knows, actually. When people hear misinformation from people who have an agenda or disinformation, then it's easy if you really don't know what's distinctive about science to start to question it. People harbor several myths about how science works, think that science is about proof and certainty, which it's not. I started to think about something that I call the scientific attitude. The idea that what's really distinctive about science isn't some methodology. It's the attitude that you have going into exploring the natural world. I was interested in going out on the road to talk to people about their beliefs. I went out to talk to coal miners about climate change. And what I discovered is that the people that I spoke with believed in climate change which was fascinating to me because they weren't deniers and yet they continued to be coal miners. One of the coal miners said to me that if he went down into the mine every day to risk his own life, then it bothered him less that he was risking the lives of other people on the planet 10 or 20 years from now through climate change. And he really had to feed his family. He really didn't have any other choice. In November 2018, I bought a ticket to go to the Flat Earth International Conference in Denver. For the first day, I went incognito. I wanted to talk to them about their reasoning strategy. We've never been to space, period, end of. I wanted to go see people face to face and engage with them. And I took one fellow out for dinner and we spoke for two hours. I didn't get anybody to tear off their lanyard and leave the conference with me. But I think that I did begin to build some foundation to trust me so that I might be able to go back and continue to work on it. So when I say that we live in a post-truth era, I don't mean that truth doesn't matter or that nobody cares about truth. What I mean is that truth is under assault by people who have an agenda. I define post-truth as the political subordination of reality which is when you know that something isn't true, but you wish that it were true, and so you begin to pump out disinformation. They'll be bribing, they'll be paying off people to grab some. The whole post office scam, they'll blame it on the post office. You could see them setting it up. As the Yale historian Timothy Snyder said, post-truth is pre-fascism, because if you look at people who engage in the political subordination of reality, the reason they do it is because if you can convince people that they really can't know truth outside a political context, they get cynical and they begin to look toward their leader to tell them what's actually true. As I say in my book, the post-truth era didn't start with Trump, but he is the result of it. What he was effectively saying is, this is what my presidency is going to be. I'm going to tell you what's true, and we're going to proceed from there. Most recently, it's happening with the election. The election is over, but Trump is still fighting it. It's not because he doesn't think that Biden beat him. It's because he doesn't want it to be true. So I think that what's going on these days, you know, kind of the aftermath. I know you heard we had an election that was stolen. The soft coup, if you want to think of it that way, is maybe the best example of post truth. If he were able to succeed, that's the road to fascism. We love you. You're very special. I know how you feel. Post truth grew out of 50 years of unchecked science denial. It started with the tobacco lobby trying to say that cigarette smoking didn't cause cancer. Did you know that after years of research, there is no scientific proof that cigarette smoking causes human disease? That worked so well that the tactics were copied by the climate change deniers. ExxonMobil knew 30 years ago that climate change was real, but they were donating a ton of money to a whole denialist propaganda campaign because they're making money off fossil fuels. Those tactics worked so well that they were borrowed by political operatives who wanted to use it to argue about the size of their inauguration or whether they actually won an election. 
it's all the same thing. It all comes from the same root, which is that if we don't actually deal with denialism when it seems like it doesn't count, then it metastasizes, and pretty soon it does count. The interesting part for me as a scholar is to watch what happened with COVID denial. In real time, I watched a denialist campaign be born. It's going to disappear. One day, it's like a miracle. It will disappear. There's no reason to panic. And people are dying from this. People die when the leader of a country is a science denier. That's what happens. When somebody asks me, is there a way out of either science denial or the post-truth era, I feel both hope but also a little despondent because of the amount of work that's ahead of us. I think that the only solution is to go at it one by one. There's empirical work which shows that it can be successful to get out there and talk with people who disagree with us. We can do amazing things when we begin to talk to one another, but we have to talk. I'm a Chinese-born British sociologist. My main interest is in the transnational governance of emerging technologies in relation to the rise of new scientific powers such as China. In terms of COVID-19, I think it's an open secret now that China has censored a lot of the early scientific data. But I don't think it's just the Chinese central government. We've seen a lot of local self-censoring that's going on. In retrospect, we still don't know, had information been allowed to flow freer, would it prevent a global pandemic? We may never know. I think there is a qualitative difference between filtering misinformation and filtering those yet to confirm fact and actively deleting those inconvenient truths. I think it's the second part that have really hurt China's early response to COVID-19. Since the COVID pandemic, there has been a lot of reporting trying to review how much has been censored and how much has been deleted. New regulations in regards to COVID research put criteria on what can be published without review, and institutional review have to be in place even before the paper is submitted for peer review. If I were a researcher, I would really rethink, uh, should I invest my time in an area that I may even not get published or recognized, what's worse is that it may actually bring me some kind of social political repercussion because the idea of pursuing harmonious society has been almost constitutionalized in Chinese society. take it for granted that certain questions should not be asked and certain problems should not be investigated. And this actually inevitably leads to a lost realm of knowledge that also leads to lost realm of options. A lot of people ask me, how do you carry out research in a country full of secrecy? There are people who want to know the truth. They're also eager to share both of their failures and success. In my research, the more I have conversation with Chinese scientists, the more confident I become because at the individual level, people are much more open-minded. I do think they're a different form of science denialism in China. I perhaps would phrase it more as science skepticism is very similar to what we are witnessing in the West. The Chinese public too, they're highly skeptical of commercial-led science or commercial lobbying. I think COVID was a chance for China to show its scientific capacity. China has really intended to make the COVID vaccine as a showcase, but I think the lack of data transparency has hurt that initiative. Everything that's happening in China is related to how the global public would perceive science. So if Chinese vaccine goes wrong, it could affect the global confidence of vaccines. And this is why we need transnational collaborative efforts. I don't think we're living in a post-truth era. 
I think a lot of people describe the time as post-truth because a particular type of truth that we're used to, the type of truth that's held by liberal academics, we're post an era where that specific perspective on how we know about the world plays a hegemonic role. We are at the end of a 300-year run of a liberal vision of the world. Instead, what is required is a continuous presence through which collegiality as well as influence are established across borders. And research practice are subject to evaluation and re-evaluation corresponding to evolving global and domestic contexts. Of course, the world is still not flat. Has there ever been cases where scientific transparency gone wrong? It really depends on who you ask. If you ask scientists, it would be half-half because there were cases where honest mistakes has been made, but it forced them to reflect on their work in a way that has never thought before. And if you ask the public, it's ambivalent because the public actually do not want to know bad news. But also, it's only through the exposure of errors and the ability for the society to overcome those errors. It's only through that can a society truly embrace what Lee said as a scientific attitude. When you were talking about deleting truth or censorship in China, that's almost the flip side of the way that science denial happens in the United States through disinformation campaigns. It's not to cover up what's true, not to censor it, but to flood it with disinformation. So, I mean, there are two ways to hide something. One is to remove it. The other is to leave it where it is and to surround it with distraction. When we talk about science denialism, the focus is on what has been denied. But I think what's been less talk about is for whom it was denied. And who are you trying to blind? You put your finger right on it. It's who does it affect? One of the main battles that we have to fight is not just getting people to understand the facts, but getting them to care. Because if it doesn't affect them in as personal away, maybe they don't care as much. Actually, I think indifference is even yeah. worse than denial. Yeah, it's almost more corrosive. How do you get yeah. somebody to care about something that they don't care about? We're number one for climate change denial, and we're the number two polluter in the United States, and China is the number one polluter for greenhouse gases in the world. And what I discovered from this survey data is that they're not climate deniers. Why isn't China a climate denying country. So there are two things. Knowing something does not mean that you necessarily will act on it. <laughs> and, and two, it does not necessarily take denial to not do something. And COVID, in a very, very sad sense, it may have helped parts of Western world to empathize with developing worlds. In 2020 is the first time in many decades that Britain really needs to think about a third world question, that is, you want to save economy or do you want to save lives? You presented China as a nation that doesn't engage in science denial to itself. And yet, some of the great disinformation campaigns that come to Americans are fomented by the Russian and Chinese government. It's interesting to me the difference between disinformation projected outward, almost as a form of conflict between nations, and disinformation projected inward on your own citizens, right? Don't get me wrong, China does launch information wars on its own citizens. It was used to be called propaganda, but of course now we have much more updated version to that. I'm really interested in a cross-country comparison, the same type of disinformation campaign, people consume it quite differently across different cultures. If we can spot what can stop or minimize its effect, then perhaps we'll find new solutions. I've written a new book that's not out yet called How to Talk to a Science Denier. When I have a you know, advanced reader copy, I'd like to send that to you because there's a little bit of material in there from an Excellent. international perspective. To it. I so miss a Strand bookstore in New York. This is one thing I'm really craving for. For the past few years, I visit Strand once a year and it's just really heaven. I just, 
love that smell of old books. <laughs> I have a poster up. I don't know if anybody can see it right here. Powell City of Books. My hometown is Portland, Oregon, and that is somewhat like the Strand. That was my childhood bookstore, and I didn't know that that was unusual to have a childhood bookstore that was three square blocks of books. But I, I know what you mean. That's that's my idea of a good weekend vacation is going to a big bookstore. Yeah. Plus, in the age of COVID, it's perhaps good thing to go to、um, secondhand bookstores to check if you still have your sense of smell. <laughs> that's right. 